Good morning, everybody. We'll go ahead and get started this morning um, with our January 13th, 2020 uh, Planning Commission meeting. Uh, recommendations from the Planning Commission on items from this agenda will be considered by the Board of Commissioners at their regular meeting on January 21st, 2020 at 1030 a.m. The Planning Commission utilizes speaker request forms, which are available in the Commission Chambers during the meeting. And again, those are the items on, on the back. Um, there are agendas uh, for, for the meeting on the back shelf uh, by the bookshelf as well, in case anybody uh, is interested in those. First item on the agenda is roll call. Um, note that everyone is present and Mark is here from the board. Approval of the December uh, 16th, 2019 minutes. Are there any questions, modifications, or changes to the minutes? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those aye. opposed, no. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is uh, approval of the agenda. Uh, today's consent agenda consists of items three through six. Um, we have regular items uh, seven through 12 and construction permit items uh, 13 and 14, followed by um, normal housekeeping items 15 through 19. Are, are there any changes to the agenda this morning? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for approval. So move. Second. Motion and second, further discussion. Seeing none, uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Brings us to the consent agenda, agenda Good. items. Good morning, Brittany Molitor, Interim Planning Director. The consent agenda, uh, the following items have been placed on the consent agenda for action to be taken on all items in accordance with staff's recommendation by a single vote. Any item may be removed from the consent agenda by any planning commissioner, staff member, or audience member for separate consideration. The findings of this planning commission are recommendations to the Pennington County Board of Commissioners who will make the final decision. Item number three is conditional use permit review CU 1843 for border states paving to review a temporary asphalt batch plan and contractor storage area in a general agriculture district. Staff is recommending to end conditional use permit CU 1843 with the applicants and landowners concurrence. Item number four is conditional use permit CU 1936 for Black Hills Power. Kyle Young is the agent to allow for an electrical utility substation in a general agriculture district. Staff is recommending approval of conditional use permit 1936 with conditions. Item number five is minor plan unit development amendment PU 1907 for Lloyd and Catherine Marti to allow a garage as an accessory structure prior to a principal structure in accordance with section 213 of the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance and staff is recommending approval of plan unit development amendment PU 1907 with conditions. And finally, item number six is minor plan unit development amendment PU 1908 for Joel and Elizabeth Morris to live in a recreational vehicle as temporary living quarters while building a single family residence. And staff is recommending approval of minor plan unit development amendment PU 1908 with conditions. Thank you. Is there any items that staff wishes to pull from the consent? No, not at this time. Are there any items that membership wishes to pull from the consent agenda? Okay. Uh, and for the audience uh, consideration, the consent agenda is consist, consists of items that we will vote on uh, in one vote. Um, I do have speaker request forms here for item number six. Um, so um, I will I will pull item number six due to the speaker request forms and, and I would ask are there any other items uh, three, four, uh, five, or six that people wish to have pulled from the consent agenda? Seeing none from the audience. Um, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion for approval of the consent agenda items three, four, and five. So moved. moved. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion on those items? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Brings us to item number six. Uh, item number six is minor plan unit development amendment PU 1908 to live in a recreational vehicle as temporary living quarters while building a single family residence. The applicants, Joel and Elizabeth Morris, have requested this minor amendment to allow their recreational vehicle as living quarters. 
Um, as the property stands today, it consists of, sorry, I apologize. 10.33 acres. The lot contains a single family residence that is under construction. They did apply for a building permit, uh, COBP 19-522, and they have an on-site wastewater treatment system that has been installed and approved <coughs> by our on-site wastewater specialist. Um, condition number eight of the plan unit development states that approved uses of the plan unit development shall be up shall be for up to 148 stick built single family residence and accessory structures. So in order to allow a recreational vehicle to be used as living quarters, this minor plan unit development amendment is required. On January 6, 2020, staff performed a site visit and observed the following, that the single family residence is under construction and the RV is located on the site. Uh, staff is recommending approval of this minor plan unit development amendment with conditions. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff before we go to the speaker request forms? Seeing none. Um, Joel Morris, I have a speaker request form for you, sir, if you'd like to come up. Please state your name into the microphone for the record. Joel Morris. Okay. I, I just thought I had to fill that out, so. Okay. Do I need to say anything more? Or? Do you have any questions, sir? And I guess my my only question to you is, have you read through all of the recommendation and, and, and the requirements? Yep. Okay, any questions on any of that stuff? I don't believe so. Okay. Um, do I take it that the second speaker request form is, is your wife, yes, Elizabeth? Yes, and we just thought we had to fill that out too. Okay. So that was our- So no questions. No questions, right. sorry. <laughs> um, that being said, are, are there any further questions from the audience regarding this issue? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for approval per staff's recommendation. So, so approval. Second. Motion and second. Uh, further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. <clears throat> motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Brings us to uh, item seven. Good morning, Christina Proetti, planner. Item number seven is planned unit development 0607. And that's to allow for a mobile home park, storage units, and a, du a duplex and two stick built unit, uh, stick built homes, excuse me. Uh, staff has been working with Ms. Humphrey and Ms. Elteed, who is uh, actually present in the audience today. Uh, to bring the mobile home park into compliance. On Friday, which was January 10th, 2020, staff met with both Ms. Humphrey and Ms. Salteed to, um, and to date the mobile, park, mobile home park has ensured that all addresses have been posted and are visible from the street. Um, they have contracted Fisk's land surveying to do the floodplain development permit for the entirety of the whole park. Um, uh, they have ensured that there is an emergency number for the maintenance person on staff for the park and that now that the phone um, the phone is now being directed directly to Anita, who is the manager now. Um, and after speaking with both Ms. Humphrey and Ms. Elteed, uh, staff finds it reasonable that the mobile home park manager, Ms. Elteed, be at the site part-time. Um, and this is according to having the manager's office on site. Um, we feel that it's reasonable to have her there part-time as long as she's available directly by phone um, and business hours. She is working at another mobile home park as well, managing both parks. So um, we have no other reasons of concern at the moment and staff is recommending approval with 21 conditions. Um, I did give you those conditions, but would you like me to read them? Um, I don't know if that's necessary. Do you guys want her to read through these? Okay. And then the other thing I wanted to note that on item M, it said that the emails were attached and I did not attach them to the staff report, but I did bring them this morning. So I'm sorry about that. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, before I open it up for questions, I guess my, my main question, as I understood this, there was some concerns that were raised. Uh, you guys had, had reached out to them. There was uh, some non-response items that were 
um, that we're concerned with, we were going to turn it over to the, the state's attorney's office. Since then, they have responded to your guys' concerns and yes. all of the items that you guys had concerns with has, have been addressed. Is that correct? Being addressed. They're being addressed. In the process of so being addressed. So your recommendation now is for uh, approval. Approval, um, and then, of course, a review date has been if approved, a review date is set to check in with them. Okay. Are there any further questions for staff? Chairman. Go ahead, Jim. <clears throat> um, the explanation for the <clears throat> her tardiness in <clears throat> responding to these issues, uh, as I understand it, she works at another uh, mobile home park. Is that correct? I believe so. And she. Okay. Hi. Good morning. I'm Anita Altide. Um, I am the new manager for both of the trailer parks. Um, so one is off South Valley Drive, and the other one, of course, is um, at Cimarron on the other side of town. Um, I do have access to both phone numbers, so uh, residents can contact me um, through the hours that need to be for business offices. So I was trying to figure out how I could be at this park and that park um, so that residents know that I'm there and I am active within the community. So I'm out at Cimarron like three or four times a week. So, um, so I'm kind of back and forth doing both, trying to make sure that everything is compliant. And I know we have lots of work to do. Excuse me, if you could talk into the microphone, it's extremely hard to hear you. So sorry. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Uh, I have a question. <clears throat> You don't own these parks. No, I do not own the park. I'm the, just. The is manager. the owner here? The owner is not here. They are in Colorado. So they're an absentee owner. And yes. uh, did you communicate with them? I, I, the reason I'm saying this is this is a tardiness that I think should have been avoided. And I can understand if you're trying to do two jobs, more or less in the space in time of one. That's difficult, but. I also think the owners <clears throat> have some responsibility, and I'm kind of surprised we haven't heard from them and that they haven't been uh, responsive because so many of these things could have been handled, it seemed like, quickly and somewhat easily if you had been aware of them. And obviously, the system is not very effect effective in, in promoting communication. So I, I know you're going to still be working at two places. I know you're going to make a better effort, et cetera, et cetera, but you're going to be dealing with the same complications. I, I just think it's unfortunate the owner is not here to, uh, you know, understand the uh, difficulties that we're dealing with here. Right. I understand that. I just came on with the company December 9th, so I kind of got thrown in the middle. Mm -hmm. So... <laughs> trying to make the best of and make sure it's compliant and realizing what all was going on. And so now working with Christine, I want to make sure that everything is where it needs to be. I wonder if some kind of communication with the owners. I have the communicated with the owners. Okay, and they haven't responded at all? Um, there is actually an email in the packet. Uh, the owner name is Des Moines. So it, okay. that email is okay. So the owner is aware of the conditions that have been going on? Yes. Okay. Well, I, I just, because I think it's unnecessary. I think uh, good business practices would have uh, avoided this. And and, and uh, I'm certain on the part of your part, this will not happen again. But I want, I hope you'll get the support from ownership as well. So thank you. <clears throat> Go ahead, Mark. At uh, this point in time, when is the review planned? Well, I set it for one year, but of course you can change that as you see fit. I would think six, think about six that months would be sooner. more reasonable. I'm thinking sooner. Oh, I was thinking anywhere between three and six. That was going to be part of my discussion. <laughs> Further questions? Yeah. Kathy, go ahead. Christina, I'm, I just want to make sure. Now, you know, normally when we look at these, there's a list of conditions uh, when we, when this was approved you know, originally it's, you know, in our packet and so on. And I, yeah. don't, I don't see that. Um, so under, it, well, in the staff report under general descriptions, 2A, um, there's 1 through 20. And then um, item number B states that the further reviewals were right. the same, gotcha. All right. same conditions of approval. Okay. So I guess what, really what I'm trying to figure out, and, and I just, 
and I didn't and because is this this wasn't in our packet. This is new, right? Correct. I printed that out since I had met them with them on Friday. Gotcha. Okay. That was this kind of an update. So can you help me understand what conditions are new, kind of current on this list of one through twenty one so compared one through, to what was yes. in place before? One through twenty is the same. One through twenty is the same. And I have added twenty one, which is a review date. Okay. So there's really nothing all of the concerns that you'd had in the you know, toward the end of 2019 and so on, they are all, they were all concerns that were covered by the conditions currently Upon in place. Upon approval. Mm -hmm. the condition, okay. So the only thing that you've really added is the review process. Correct. Okay. Well, I tend to agree with my colleagues here that the review process, you know, considering my recollection is that there was quite a number of, of things that you had concerns that needed to be addressed. And I know winter may not always be the best time to address some of those, but um, I think six months is a more reasonable review time. I would add to the uh, to the make a change to twenty one. Yep. For six months. Gotcha. Further questions on this item? I would also like to make a suggestion then as, a, as maybe item 22 that the owners of the mobile home park uh, sign a, uh, what do we typically do, a, a memorandum of understanding that, that, that they, under yeah, yeah. they understand these and that we receive that within two business weeks or something like that. Gotcha. One more thing that probably needs to be addressed is number 18 will need to be changed to six months as well, it looks like. Okay. Oh, right. I copied that in there. Further discussion? Seeing none, the recommendation at this time is um, uh, approval of planned unit development 06-07 with, I have 22 conditions with the changes listed as number 18 being changed to six months, number 21 being changed to six months, and new item number 22, such that the owner submits a statement of understanding within two business weeks. Actually, can I say something real quick? Go ahead. Um, I believe we might consolidate 18 and 21 then, since it's saying the same thing. I'm okay. Um, so there'd okay be 21 that. conditions. 21 total right. with, the, with the addition of the statement of understanding. Yeah. Is everyone clear on that? I am. If we're good with that, I would entertain a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Uh, um, uh, Mr. Chairman, go ahead. <laughs> I, I didn't know if we had asked if anyone in the audience had comments on this. Thank you for the uh, thank you for the 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 uh, question. Um, are there any further questions from anybody in the audience on this issue? <clears throat> Seeing none in the audience, um, I will. Let's go back to where we were. Thank thanks again, Sandy, for that. Um, Go ahead, Jim. <clears throat> is the uh, <clears throat> signing of the uh, what is it? Certificate of understanding. I whatever the term is. Uh, is so. So is the approval of this contingent upon that? I assume it is. Yeah, they will have to sign that once. That's In other words, we'll have to hear condition. from these people who are the, the mysterious people in Colorado before uh, this will technically be approved or. Would you like the owners to sign the statement of understanding or the manager? Yes. The memorandum of understanding. All right, the owners. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll reach out to them today Good. regarding okay. that. Okay, yeah, I think that may be emphasize uh, our concerns. I will, yep, All right, definitely. Thank you. Further questions? Okay. Um, I believe that we had a, a motion and a second on the uh, item already. Uh, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, aye. no. Motion carries. Brings us to item eight. Again, Christina Proetti. Item number eight is layout plat 1944. Uh, staff is recommending to deny without prejudice layout plat 1944 
uh, due to uh, on January 9th, 2020, Mike Tui from KTM Design Solutions was in the Planning and Zoning Office uh, to discuss that there had been some miscommunication between the real estate agent and I believe the buyers about how the land was being reconfigured. Um, so KTM will actually be resubmitting a different layout plan to us along with the rezone request. Questions for staff? Is there anybody in the audience that would like to speak on this issue? Seeing uh, none in the audience, uh, recommendation from staff is to deny without prejudice layout plat PL 19-44. Is there a motion? <clears throat> Take it. You motion, Jim, is that right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, motion, second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Item number nine. Good morning, Commissioners. Jason Thennison, County Planner. Agenda item nine is conditional use permit 1934. The applicants are Lloyd and Pamela LaCroix. The applicants are requesting conditional use permit to allow an existing three bedroom residence to be utilized as a vacation home rental on the subject property. The zoning ordinance lists five factors the Planning Commission may consider in their review of conditional use permit applications. They're as follows, they're on the screen for you. I'll just read staff's responses to each of those. Beginning with number one, the proposed use for the single family residence as a vacation home rental should not affect the use and or enjoyment of other properties in the immediate vicinity where the use is already permitted and upon property values in the surrounding properties. Number two, it appears that by allowing this conditional use permit, the use should not affect the normal orderly development or improvement of any surrounding vacant property in the area. Number three, the proposed use of the existing single family residence should not require any utilities or facilities that are not already in place. Access is to be provided off of Ford Mountain Court. Additionally, staff has no drainage concerns relating specifically to the applicant's request at this time. Number four, the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance requires one off-street parking space per bedroom. Therefore, three parking spaces are re required and it appears that adequate parking is provided at this location. And lastly, number five, the proposed conditional use should not present odor, fumes, dust, noise, vibrations, or intrusive lighting. The applicant should take care so the proposed use does not create the above listed elements in any amount that would constitute a nuisance. As it sits today, the property is zoned General Agriculture District, consisting of 2.44 acres. There is no special flood hazard area on the property. Access is off Ford Mountain Court, and the lot contains a single family residence, a 20 by 40 garage, a 60 by 40 pole barn, and a 10 by 24 shed. Uh, there's an update to this. Condition number 14 that I have listed right now uh, states that that uh, shed doesn't have a building permit. Since the, staff, or since the staff report was written, the applicant has come in and applied for a building permit. So I'd recommend that uh, we remove that condition if you choose to approve. Uh, this request was sent out for interdepartmental review. Uh, the county addressing coordinator and emergency services both had the same comment. Uh, that the residence is more than 75 feet off Ford Mountain Court. Therefore, the house number needs to be posted in accordance with Pennington County Ordinance Number 20. This includes posting it on a sign where the driveway intersects Ford Mountain Court. And this is included as a condition of approval. Uh, Pennington County Zoning Ordinance Section 206 lists vacation home rental as a conditional use in a general agriculture district. Applicant has complied with all of the application and submittal requirements for VHR listed in the zoning ordinance. Therefore, staff recommends approval of conditional use permit 1934 with conditions. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff before we go to the speaker request forms? Uh, of note, I'm sorry, commissioners. Uh, uh, I did receive a uh, concern from the neighborhood uh, uh, looks like the homeowners of Elkhorn Mountain View Estates and surrounding neighbors uh, expressing concern about the vacation home rental. And I'm not sure if any of those have filled out speaker request forms to uh, come up here and state their concerns. 
I received this this morning. Mr. Chairman. I've received two speaker request forms thus far on that. So go ahead, Sandy. I'm just, is this the letter that was handed to us when the meeting started? Correct. All right, thank you. Any further questions? Okay, seeing none, we can go to the speaker request forms. The first one I have is, uh, um, uh, hope I don't crucify this, Mit Mitchell Lewis, M Middle Lewis, MIT. Sir, if you would state your name for the record at the morning, it's Michael Lewis. That's Thank okay. <laughs> it's so fouled up that I named okay. my son that too, and he did his. So that's the way it works. Uh, I live one notch over from where this house is. Uh, my name is Michael Lewis. I uh, built the house in '79 where we live now. We raised six kids. I was with GE for many years out on the road. Retired, and this is where my wife and I are going to live our lives out. A little disconcerting to find out that a vacation home was going to be put in our area. And, and I'll, I'll tell you why. On the other side of Hill City, we have some good friends that were lucky enough to have a vacation home come in beside them about a year and a half ago. Here's what I found in talking with them. They have RTVs that come in from Wisconsin and Minnesota, tons of them. Noise carrying on. You've got Harleys that come in with no pipes, as you're very familiar with. You have dogs that come in. We raise chickens for a hobby, uh, <laughs> something that we really don't want. We also, they have beach parties, <laughs> noise and all that. And the, the thing that, that I've said to my friend is, you know, have you called the owner? And the owner lives in Rapid City. And he says, yes. And each time the owner says, oh, geez, I'm sorry. It won't happen again. Year and a half this has been going on. Uh, I took a quick look at the tax rolls from Pennington County. Uh, the LaCroix own about 11 pieces of property, so they're in the, in the house business, and that's fine, I have no problem. I've been in business too, uh, to make a profit, they need to do it. We need rental houses around Hill City big time. We don't need a vacation home. If, if the LaCroix make money from this, the ones that are gonna pay for it are those 12 of us or so that are sitting here now we're going to pay for it. We really are. I, I would, I would just as soon it not be in our neighborhood. Thank you. Question. Go ahead, Is there sir. Questions. Yes. How far away is your residence from the? Vacation uh, if you there? look at that picture, we're just above the uh, where that barn is, the red barn. We're just above that. We can see it. So, would you say you're six hundred feet, a thousand feet? Oh, I, I suppose six hundred, if, if the way the crow flies. The way everything is laid in there, our house directly faces that red barn. We can see it right off of our porch. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Go ahead, Travis. Just out of curiosity, you mentioned your friend who has a VHR, um, and he tried to contact the owner of that particular VHR. Has he ever contacted the police whenever there's a violation of yes, law? Yes, and in fact, uh, they're against the Forest Service, and the Forest Service has been out a couple different times now. And in fact, they ticketed a bunch of people from Wisconsin because of their four-wheelers. They bring out like a car carrier with the four-wheelers stacked on it. And uh, th yeah, the Forest Service actually gave them a, a warning or a ticket, I guess it was. They, they ended up going to federal court here and they paid a fine. We don't have Forest Service right against that house, so that's not a problem. As far as law enforcement, there have been some out on some of the beach parties. Yeah. I I'm certainly not going to name the person. That wouldn't be right. But I guess you just have to trust me. You, you fellas know me. Uh, that's what I was told. Thank you. Are there further questions for... Mr. Lewis. Thank you, Thank you sir. Yep. Uh, the next speaker request form uh, for this item is uh, Tim Brown. Yep, just stay here. Okay. Uh, my name is Tim Braun. I was the one that wrote the letter that everyone got here just a few minutes ago. Uh, that was written at, in conjunction with the help of all the neighbors from around. Uh, we got together on a Sunday afternoon at my house and went through, as Michael said, a lot of the things and we could mention more and more of them. But we do have a covenant and in uh, Pennington County Zoning and Ordinance, it does talk about the uh, 
uh, denial and conditions of the vacation home rentals with, uh, if there's not a, maybe considered the provision of the restrictive covenants with expressly and specifically excluding the use of uh, residents as a vacation rental home. Well, our covenants was written 50 years ago before vacation rental homes were even thought of. Uh, it doesn't specifically state that, it states, uh, but describes them as a residential lot, not as a commercial building. Uh, the other one is the noxious, no use, no noxious or offensive trade or activity shall be carried up on the lot and so on. Uh, that, as Michael stated, is one of our big concerns uh, throughout everyone. That's where, that's where we grow up. We're a very close-knit neighborhood. We know everybody's vehicles that come and go. We take, you know, watch out for everyone else. My concern is uh, the tools and the whatnot that everyone has in their garage and stuff. Uh, I don't want different people every weekend coming in and seeing what I have to, for them to steal. I mean, granted, that's not the case for 99% of the people, but that 1%, I don't want to have my stuff or my, uh, have to worry about that. Um, is there a covenants or a restriction as to how they approve the, the renters? Is there background checks? Is there, how does that work? I don't know. Uh, do they just get a phone call? Okay, you rent, that's fine. We get paid. Um, and the tax issues. Uh, our, our market value is going to go down on our house, on our properties. Um, I would hope that it would be up to you if this is approved that you're going to see that our tax rate goes down too um, because that's what's not going to follow would be my prediction to have my lot is right next door, right across the barbed wire fence. Um, I have the two lots that you can partially see there. Everyone else is within... Gary here is within 200 feet. It's right out his front door. The whole, you know, four-wheeler noise, uh, trespassing, whatnot. How do we enforce that? We can call Lloyd, and I'm sure I've met with Lloyd and Pam and have no ill feelings with them, and I would just assume that they lived out there and be one of our neighbors. Uh, I think they're great people, so it's not against Pam and Lloyd. It's against the whole vacation home rental system in the hills, it's taken away from the private families being able to, to buy a house, bring family in, support the school districts, uh, this type of issue. Um, our neighborhood's being turned into a commercial spot zoning as a commercial entity. Um, so th the rest of the concerns and stuff I'm sure you've all heard. Um, I know Kathy lives next door to a vacant house. Next week, then people could be here asking for the same vacation home rental permit. Um, you know, they're great as long as they're not next door to you. So it could happen to any one of us. I guess, you know, we could go on with the, the horror stories and whatnot, but I'm sure you've all heard them. So that's something I'd like to you to consider. And I'm not sure how the process works. If you approve it, that's the end of it, or I'd like this letter to go to the commission it talks about here for review. Um, like I say, I don't know how the, how the process works. So Sir, I'll leave it up to you. That Thank you. Vac vacation home rental would be uh, reviewed on a complaint basis, um, and, it, and again at one year, correct? Um, so if something was going awry uh, with that vacation home rental, then you guys would be able to come in a year from now or file complaints and, uh, and possibly something w would get done about it. My question is, is that um, there's a big fear all the time that, that property values are going to go down. How long has the other vacation rental been in your neighborhood? There's another one in your neighborhood already, I, I understand. I'm not aware of which one that is. Yeah, the one that he was talking about where they're bringing in four-wheelers and... Oh, that was up Deerfield Road. Oh, that's in a different neighborhood. <clears throat> that's in a 
I'm not sure where that home is at, but it, he told me it was up Deerfield Road someplace. Okay, and I've understood that in some cases it actually increases the value of homes in the neighborhood. Well, I don't know if anybody would want to buy a house right next to them, so I guess I would disagree with that or not really. Uh, I don't have any evidence one way or the other right. okay. or any proof one way or the other. The other thing that I forgot to mention was the, the permit rolls from owner to owner. If Lloyd was decided to sell in two years, whatever, it could go to a industry or a company that is just based on rentals and has no care whatsoever about the neighborhood. We would ask that a condition be put on it that the permit stays with Lloyd and Pam. It doesn't travel to the next owner uh, to, in an effort to keep corporations or people that are there strictly for the financial gain and um, don't care about the, the neighborhood we have. That's understandable. I mean, they, they know Lloyd and Pam, and they know Lloyd and Pam are good people. And I mean, I could understand why you'd want that stipulation put on there. Well, could I don't I have an issue with that. Yeah, if I could make a comment on that. I mean, the current owners are using it solely for rental income. So if, 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 if it were they or if it were a corporation, it wouldn't make much difference because the goal is for them to have rental income. Um, does, does that make sense to you? I, my hearing is bad. So, so I, is mine. <laughs> um, the, uh, <laughs> Restricting it only to the LaCroix yeah. doesn't make sense. Be and my thinking is the LaCroix are also using it solely for a vacation rental income. Right. You indicated they own 11 properties, so this isn't a house that they live in. Right. It's one that they would want. Okay. You know, so one could put that restriction on, but I don't think it would make any difference. I, I think if there is going to be a negative impact, it will happen no matter who the owner is. And my other comment is, I personally live in a home that contiguous, on the contiguous lot, is a vacation home rental, and my assessed value keeps going up. So, you know, <laughs> I haven't noticed any, you know, any problem with it. My other comment is, covenants are not enforced by the county. So you may have covenants, but it's my understanding that we as a board have no authority to enforce the covenants that are on there. And, and Can I ask, who does enforce the covenants? It's my understanding if the, you have the homeowners a complaint. Board. The homeowners association. Yeah, the homeowners association, and then they would have to hire an attorney to do battle. <clears throat> and, and lastly, it would be up to the owner themselves as to how they screen the potential tenants. You know, do they charge a $5,000 security deposit or $500 or, you know, each, each owner would have their own criteria as far as how they would screen the people who would be staying there. So that's just additional information, okay. the you know, for you. I'd like to oh, the answers to that. maybe clarify my comment earlier about that sounds like a reasonable request. Um, I think that a lot of people's concern is that we're going to get these outside owners from other states that have no physical contact whatsoever with these vacation home rentals or even a rental for that matter. Um, and I believe your uh, maybe comfort level would be higher if you knew that only Lloyd and Pam were who are local, who will have access to these, to this rental, um, it would make those neighbors more comfortable knowing that they at least have a local manager yeah, uh, checking up sense. on things you know, that kind of stuff. Yeah, exactly. And in talking with Lloyd and Pam, I know at the time, anyhow, their uh, plan was <laughs> as they retire to be able to move out to this. Uh, neighborhood. Whether that's still true or changes, I that's up to them, I guess. But like you said, having a local people running it rather than a distant business running the this part of it 
uh, we feel like we'd have more more say and more communication with them. I understand. And sir, your your property is within 500 feet of the, of this subject property. Okay, You're immediately adjacent. Adjacent. Okay. okay. So item number 11, at one of the uh, one of the recommendations uh, and the, one of the conditions of approval is that if the person designated as the local contact is ever changed from Lloyd Lacroix, the interior informational sign be updated, and the applicant re-notify the planning director and surrounding landowners within 500 feet via notices sent by first class mail. So one of the conditions of approval for this is that you specifically get notified if the local contact ever changes from Lloyd. Right. So I just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. But it can change and we can sit here again and it'll be approved or whatever again. Understood. Uh, how does this vacation home rental have an impact on the residential hotels and motels and rental areas, uh, resorts. Uh, are we getting, is the area getting saturated with uh, vacation home rentals to where it's doing damage to the, to the local businesses? Uh, I don't know the answer. I'm not sure who does know the answer. I just take it as a consideration. Mark. Did you, were you going to talk? Um, I was just going to ask Jason a question. Doesn't uh, apply to what he just asked. I have no idea yeah, the answer I to your question. Don't tell you um, but I guess my question to Jason would be, is that possible to have a condition of this vacation home rental that if it changes hands, that they have to reapply for the vacation home rental and it's not just continued forward? Uh, we have a specific statement in or a specific portion of our zoning ordinance that applies to transfers so uh, i don't know at this time that you could doesn't seem to be very them. restrictive I though Michelle am i correct here. Brittany? but just notification it doesn't require that it be reapproved as a matter of fact i think that the language in it if i read it correctly kind of makes it easier for the next owner to get approval if it was already being used as a vacation <laughs> home rental. They just have to meet all of the specific conditions. They have to get their lodging licenses, their sales tax license, um, things like that. They have to meet the criteria, their septic, um, get the letter from the state for their septic, and they just notify all of the neighbors within 500 feet of the new ownership. So is there a way that we can be more restrictive under certain you know, applicants or what have you, concerns by the neighbors, what? I think on conditional use permits, you do have the use or the ability to put specific conditions on Add without them having there. to get a variance uh, to certain requirements. Um, you could make, add, maybe add the, to these conditions that you actually want a hearing or, you know, be brought in front of the planning commission for a hearing uh, upon notification. It's just, you know, it, it's allowed under our ordinance. That's the difficult process is it's allowed to be transferred, you know, with these conditions. Um, Could comments from the rest of you guys? I, go ahead, Sandy. <clears throat> um, my only comment is if he were notified that the owner had changed, couldn't he then okay. register a complaint? This is contingent upon review and or complaint. Couldn't he register a complaint and then it would come back before the planning commission? That's correct. If you if we receive a complaint, then that would trigger a review at okay. that time. Okay, then, sir, you could register a complaint. So we would register our complaints here? Yes. Uh, to the planning department, and they then would bring it before the planning commission, and then it goes to the county commissioners. Okay, and that would taking be... Order. Uh, you know, excessive noise, uh, partying type complaints, or would they be registered with Lloyd at that time or the police? Um, all, all of the above. Uh, yeah, any or all of the above. Kathy. Yeah, Ms. Chairman. You know, I just, for the record, I want to say I live in this neighborhood. This is my neighborhood, essentially, that they're referring to. I may live uh, probably less than, I'm certainly less than a mile from right. your place, Tim. So, um, and I know this property, um, you know, I know exactly where it is. So I, I guess I just have a few things I want to say to this. Um, 
you know, I know the people that live right around the corner on Pink Cabin, uh, and they have that vacation home rental kind of up on the hill there. Okay, um, yeah. And, you know, in, in visiting with them, their concern isn't the vacation home rentals per se. It's all of the unregistered uh, vacation for fee lodging that some people in our neighborhood engage in. And they're not registered, they're not licensed as vacation home rentals, but nonetheless, they, on a regular basis, um, they're engaging in it. They're engaging in it. And so that's the big concern. <clears throat> and, and I talked to some of the hotel owners in the area. And of course, they're concerned about vacation home rentals, but they also say that more troublesome are all of the people that advertise for home for rent uh, without going through the process of getting to be a licensed VHR. And um, so, on some degree, at least, having the licensed uh, VHR gives some level of certainty as opposed to the other situation. Right. And, and the other unfortunate thing, that, as well, I understand it, um, is that there is a Sturgis exemption that you can lease your home for, if it's under two weeks during the Sturgis rally, without registering as a VHR or oh. good thing. Yeah, it's, isn't that correct? That's correct. Actually, throughout, throughout the year. Throughout the year. Yeah. It's up to 14 days throughout Okay, the year. throughout the year, really. But I mean, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's was done, I think, for the most part, to right. allow Harleys in our neighborhood. And um, uh, and so I've heard some complaints about that, that um, that, that that that's a real irrit some, you know, irritable deal that when they come in. And I don't blame people at all. Um, but the other, so, so I mean, at least the vacation home rental, there is a process. I understand your concerns entirely, that it's really nice to know who you can pick up the phone to call um, if there's concerns. And, um, and and so to have some, to try to put a little bit more restrictions on that, I think is certainly a good a good start. Um, but the other thing is that we've had a few other people come before this where there's, the covenants were developed decades ago right. before this was ever considered. And it prompted them to update the covenants. And also in one case I know of, they did, take civil action uh, to to try to enforce the covenants that were done decades ago, even though it didn't expressly talk about vacation home rentals. And I really don't know how that turned out, but um, I know that that's happening in some cases so that the, you know, that the creep, as you're concerning about, uh, you know, doesn't happen and that you, you know, put some boundaries around this through your covenant process. But enforcing covenants, it does take a legal civil action to, um, to do that. So, you know, just, just so you know, I'm not unsympathetic to the cause. I know exactly what house you're referring to that is owned by absentee owners in our neighborhood, mm -hmm. which is the next, my, our neighbor. And would we like it as a vacation home rental? Sometimes I'm not so sure that that's not happening right there because of the different out-of-state license plates that show up in the yard. But I don't know. Um, but uh, And we've not had any trouble with with a few times a dog got over and came to visit our dog and this and that. But, you know, we really haven't had any trouble. Right. So I'm not unsympathetic of, of you and your neighbor's concerns on this. And, and to the extent that you can create a little tighter boundary around this for moving forward, would probably be advisable. Okay. Further questions from Mr. Mr. Braun? Go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> well, first I want to speak in favor of the Sturgis exemption because I, it helped put my <laughs> kids through college. <laughs> and uh, so I feel strongly about uh, the capacity to use those two weeks for rental, at least around the, uh, for the rally. Uh, I, I'm struck by the f uh, first by the fact that you've never lived in an area that really has vacation rentals. And you've heard stories, as we all have. Of course, people tell stories if they're dramatic, and the dramatic ones are the worst ones. And so my experience has been that, uh, in general, vacation home rentals have been very good, and that most people behave as they do, I think, when they're on vacation generally, particularly families, at their very best. And the other thing I've discovered is that in some areas where they have vacation home rentals, uh, the neighbors, uh, folks like you, 
have gotten together. You, you made a comment that you know everybody who comes in because you recognize the cars and so forth, understandably. And when a new person comes in in the middle of the summer and you know almost instinctively that this is a vacation home renter, these people show up in the front door of these folks and they welcome them. Not, we don't send, the, 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 the owner doesn't send his agent, the owner doesn't show up, the neighbor shows up. And they chat with them, they welcome them. And I, my experience has been, the people I've talked to who have done this, is it's been a very powerful element in making those people to behave like you because you have welcomed them as members of your community. And we all know that we don't wanna let our neighbors down. And as soon as you start feeling like a neighbor, I think you start acting like one. So uh, th this, this is not, of course, a foolproof solution. We, we have to, we're, at times we have to, you know, resort to the use of police powers and so forth. But I think it's very, very rare. And I just wanna emphasize that I do think that while I understand your, your need and desire to protect the integrity of your community, I don't think you should be as frightened under the circumstances as you are at the moment. I, I, I'm trying to reassure you. So I, I think it's um, a situation that all of your neighbors are gonna discover will turn out generally far, far better than you anticipate. So. <clears throat> Further questions for Mr. Braun? Mr. Chair, I have a question ahead, for staff. Sam. I'm just hoping to get maybe little statistics for everybody to be aware of. As far as the number of VHRs, hundreds, or even more than a thousand of them in the, in the county? Uh, if I were to hazard guess, uh, I'd say in the hundreds. I don't think we're quite okay. over a thousand. Yeah. And uh, the complaints on an annual basis, do you have any idea how many complaints there, there are? Many. Not many. Not many. I think this is important to point out. and. I think like everybody else here, we're sympathetic to the concerns, absolutely. I'd be more so sympathetic if it was an out-of-state owner. Right. So I think you can rest assured if this VHR is approved, you've got a pretty best-case scenario with somebody local as the owner. Thank you. Further questions for Mr. Brown? Thank you, Mr. Brown. Thank you. Um, that was the last speaker request form that I had for that item. Is there anybody else in the audience that would wish, wishes to speak on this issue? Come on up, sir. Thank you, commissioners. <clears throat> and I, you know, I really appreciate the residents coming up here. I mean, they have legitimate concerns. I mean, something's changing in their neighborhood. Uh, a little bit of the story I can tell you is that yeah. Pam and I decided to buy this property after some long looks. Lloyd, and, could you state your name for the oh, record? Excuse me, Lloyd yeah. LaCroix, I'm the applicant. Thank you. Uh, we took a long, long time before we picked this property to purchase because we worked, you know, I, as one of the, Mike just said that we have several properties in Rapid City for rentals that we do. and. And that's what we've done after 10 years ago. We invested and started working on that as a supplemental income in case something happened to our jobs and so forth. Well, it's worked out to us to where we were able to pay off our main home sooner. And our dream was to get a house in the hills. And we found this one after looking and looking. And uh, that's why we decided to buy it. Number one, it's got a 40 by 60 shop, three bedroom, but we're not ready to retire. You know, we still got about 12 to 15 years left to retire. So it made sense to us to do a vacation home rental and us do weekends or schedule in whatever, whatever we want and still be able to use the shop every day if I need to go out there and do something. I keep my stuff out there. I'm going to. Uh, and use the, to be able to pay for itself and do some land improvements because the property does need some improvements. The, the current owners have been away from it for a year and a half to two years and they need some work. So we wanted to use the vacation rental as that 
supplemental income to help build it up. But it, our main plan is to have to be an active uh, land manager. I mean, I'm keeping the shop there. We're 25 minutes away. Uh, we've looked into management companies. We've never done vacation home rentals before. I've saved up plenty of them. And uh, I've used them and I can tell from the residents that things are changing out there for vacation rentals with motels and and, and so forth. You know, the, the taxing and the fees and, and so forth. In fact, the last trip I did, I stayed at a motel, not a vacation rental because it was cheaper. So uh, our intent for this property is totally to be our property once we retire, but to use the vacation as supplemental and do land improvements and so forth. I've met several of the, uh, a couple of the neighbors. Um, I sent out a letter, you know, I knew this was, is a hard thing to swallow for a neighborhood. Uh, I, I didn't see it in the packet that the letter that uh, Pam and I had sent that uh, what our intent is for the property and, how, and if you have any concerns, I'm more than willing to put any restrictions on and follow any additional things that the residents want. So one of the biggest concerns is we'll have it in our agreement that you stay in, in the forms of the property, no wandering up the hill. It says, you know, this is uh, private property from this section on, make sure that they know that. Uh, we want to be respectful to the residents. So we sent out our name and our number. I, I have no problem. I can be there in 25 minutes if something's going on. Uh, but I just wanted to express that. And I'm, I understand their concerns. They're, I mean, they're legitimate. They've got a nice neighborhood. They're friendly. They're, Gary was the first one to come on over and, and, and introduce himself and, He's a good where he works and what he's doing and said, beware, you know, I, I do this on 4th of July and so forth. And that, that's, that's all great. But I think, you know, we're going to be more involved than most that you've seen. Vacation rentals coming through. So uh, that's about, probably about the only thing I wanted to pass on. I have no, absolutely no problem with uh, if the property changes hand that, uh, a notice gets sent to the property owners that it's not transferable as a vocational rental. I have absolutely no problem with that. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions for Mr. LaCroix? That would be my recommendation that we we, we put a limitation on this uh, approval if it beca if it gets approved um, that the permit ends if the ownership of the property changes, which it sounds like it's not going to eventually Lloyd and Pam are moving in, so um, and they'll be your neighbors, and you like them, so that's a good thing. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, are there any other folks in the audience that wish to speak on this issue? Sir, come on up. Please state your name. My name is Verlon Schultz, and I live uh, right across the road from the property. Is there any chance we could put that previous screen back up there that showed the property? There. <clears throat> okay. Uh, it, to the right side of the picture, is the old hill city road and just to the right of that is my land so i'm about as close to it as anybody else that road gets a tremendous amount of traffic <clears throat> and at the lower right corner is a bad intersection because that hill it comes down coming from hill city it's downhill and that's kind of a low point and too many cars are going way too fast there. It makes it difficult to pull out. And it would be even worse if you had a, you know, a, a camper or a motorhome or something like that. And then it goes back uphill again. <clears throat> well, one concern that nobody mentioned, I guess, if, um, for instance, somebody's going to rent it and they, they get on their GPS or maybe just visual, and they turn in there, on Ford Mountain Court Road. And if they should miss that driveway going up to the rental, that road, as you can see, 
winds around eventually to the right up there. And Tim's, Tim Braun was just speaking. His house is just to the left of that upper part of the road. Uh, many times I drive past his house or go to see him <clears throat> and one of his, or two of his three garage doors are open, uh, which is one concern if there's kids nosing around or something like that. And as he said, he owns that lot right above it too. And kids like to roam around. I did the same thing when I was a kid and probably wouldn't do any harm, but uh, if they have barking dogs or, or something like that, uh, it would be worse. And on the very lower left of that picture, if they miss Tim's driveway and go, there's another road just keeps on going straight up there, about another 100 feet or 150 feet, they'll come into uh, our other neighbor, uh, Jean and Mark, and she is here, but uh, that's my main concern is some traffic problems, some noise problems. Uh, like you say, most of them are really good, and there's a few percent that are going to uh, cause some problems. Personally, if they get go up that hill to the right toward Hill City, my driveway is just a, beyond the uh, where the picture ends. And if they miss the Ford Mountain Court, they're gonna end up up in my driveway, which happens to be a pretty wide one, and turn around and dig out a bunch of gravel as they do usually. But the other thing is, uh, you know, it's a pretty convenient place to go right across the road there for, uh, you know, if somebody wants to play around with a four-wheeler or kids in there or whatever. So that's my main concerns is the traffic flow, uh, the extra noise, activity. It's a pretty quiet neighborhood. Just don't really want to see that go away. We've been there 40 years and uh, we like it just the way it is. I thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Schultz. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Schultz? Thank you. Is there anyone else in the audience that wishes to speak on this issue? Put that picture back up, please. Yeah, please state your name, sir, for the record. My name's Robert Leeson. Uh, I go by Gary. Okay. You can see on the lower that little Y there that goes up to back of my house. My problem is, is when we get these out of staters coming in, they are only staying two weeks or so. No, if it, they're going to rent that thing out, I'd rather see it go for at least a year. Just go ahead and rent the thing out for a year. This way we get to know the people. When these out of staters come in, we don't know who they are. I'm not going over there every day to check with the different people, get a feel of them. Right now I have a problem. Got the KOA right down the road. We got RVs coming up using our driveway to turn around. You see that little plot of grass there on the bottom, right? That's where they turn around a lot of them. They're ripping my field to hell up. And you know, it's, now we're gonna get out of staters coming in, pulling campers or RVs, no, nah, I'm against it. You know, I went over, I talked with Lloyd, you know, they were nice people. Good, I drive Rapid City every day. Go ahead and move in. You know, I just don't want to see out of staters coming up, have my garage door open, full of tools, because I, I dink around in there a lot. And a lot of times during the summer, the garage door is always open. And I might be working out back. And half the time, I'm not going to know who these people are. You know? So that's my objection there. 
And I just wish you all take that in consideration. Got any questions for me? Questions? Sir, for Mr. If you don't mind. Listen. Go ahead. <clears throat> Regardless whether it happens to be someone who's a VHR or a new resident that might be there for a year or just someone who's coming into the community, someone goes in your garage, what would you do? I'll shoot them. <laughs> I kid you not. I'll shoot them. Well, I had that one coming. She guess you should call the cops to somebody stealing stuff from you. And if anybody's violating the law, that's what should be going on. Regardless whether it's a temporary renter, whether it's a long-term renter, or whether it's somebody who's coming onto your property that doesn't even belong in the neighborhood. It doesn't matter. They come in my property there, I'll take them out. Okay. Fair enough. I, I was just pointing out that there's a legal way to do it if anybody is violating the noise ordinance, if anybody is violating trespassing. If anybody's doing it, there there is a way to, to handle those issues. By the time the police get up there, they'll be long gone. Okay. You know. So if somebody's in my garage or something, they're going down then. Whether I take a bat to their head or shoot their feet or something, I don't know. <laughs> Depends what how I feel at the time. Okay. That's all I had there. Any further questions for Mr. Leeson? Thank you, sir. beauty of living in the United States. That's correct. Any further um, comments on this item from the audience? Seeing none, uh, recommendation um, from staff was for uh, approval with um, the 16 conditions that are there and there was discussion about adding a 17th condition um, for uh, that the permit is, ends if ownership of the property uh, ends from the applicant. Is that correct, Mark? Correct. I would move for approval with that condition added and just to let the neighbors know that we will review on a complaint basis and it will be reviewed again in one year. And if there's all kinds of trouble that you guys experience, then uh, things could change immediately. Commissioner Marsh. Also recommend yes. to uh, remove condition number 14 for the building permit for the shed. Okay. Is that okay with the motion? And I'm waiting for a second. I'll second that. Motion and second to approve conditional per, uh, use permit 1934 with, it would be a total of 16 conditions, removing 14 and adding the one uh, from Mr. DeSanto. We're clear on that. All those in, excuse me. Uh, what, what is the motion again? Is, does the, mo this the motion the is for that, uh, uh, that that it cannot be automatically transferred. Correct. Correct. That the permit ends. Right. And, uh, you know, I'm I'm uncomfortable with that. <coughs> I'm surprised that I am, because I'm usually uh, in favor of uh, regulation over you know uh, faith in somebody's behavior. But uh, uh, we it seems to me that. It initially, this ordinance did not have that provision, and there were many people who said that this imperiled the use of their property and the transfer of their property, because once you establish it as a vacation home rental, some people want to continue to, to, to use it for that, and uh, it made it difficult to uh, promote these properties. Uh, and my, and, and so I, I I doubt I can persuade any of you, <laughs> but I am going to exercise and express my um, uh, concern about the legal nature of this, if we can actually do this, and whether we ought to do it uh, in as quickly and as casually as we have. I know we've thought about it, but it, it's a fairly serious uh, departure from what uh, the ordinance has been uh, providing. So then I would be inclined to think that maybe we ought to give it more thought. Um, so I, I think I will vote against it on that basis unless I hear otherwise. Um, and uh, I, I, I may be wrong on this, but I, I, I honestly believe that I have a certain trepidation about th this sort of infringement, as I say, uh, with not as much thought as we normally would do on something like this. And Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Travis. I would, that was my struggle too, putting a restriction on it. Again, I'm a private property rights individual. If you're going to do something with your property and, they, and you meet all the requirements to do so on your property, I think you should be able to do it. Um, 
unless I see something that shows that we typically put it on there, I think I have to agree with Jim that um, we haven't been doing that on, we haven't been isolating them only to that particular owner. Um, I look at it in the same way Jim is, and, and I was contemplating whether I vote for yes, just to say, uh, let's let it move forward for the simple fact that uh, it allows uh, the property owner to do everything that he wants to do, except for has that little bit of restraint. I think if I vote no on this, my no vote is solely in the aspect of the um, the restriction on it. I do support him being able to do it, uh, just like I'd support anybody else in that community being able to do it, um, but I don't necessarily support the restriction. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, so in my um, what, two and a half years on this board, I've seen a few other instances where something unusual was added to a particular conditional use permit that it wasn't typically done throughout. So I think that that, that part doesn't bother me, that this would have a restriction which isn't typically added to um, have condition, which isn't typically added to others, uh, because it's there's precedence for that. The other part I'd like to point out is that just because this conditional use permit would end with a transfer of ownership, it doesn't mean that the new owner couldn't pursue a conditional use permit to continue as a vacation home rental. It's just that it would trigger a review uh, in the same way we're, we're looking at it now, hearing. And I do think that um, the ownership and the, the agent matters. And in this case, it's one of the same, that um, LaCroix own it and they're going to be the active manager. I think that matters. Um, and so the, the putting this condition on it to add this restriction, um, I, don't, I just don't see a problem with it. And, and so I, I can support that. Thank you. Are there further uh, questions? Mr. Chair. Go ahead, Mark. Um, we do have Michelle Hoffman in the audience here that could possibly come up and address the legality of that request. Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. I'm sorry, could you uh, state the question? I had to step out briefly. Okay, so what we've done is we've put a requirement on the um, conditional use permit that if, uh, for this vacation home rental, that if the property changes hands, that that permit for the vacation home rental terminates at that point in time, and the new owners would have to come back in and ask for a new permit for vacation home rental. So the conditional use is in fact for the, what is the, the vacation home? It's for the vacation home rental, but it otherwise meets all the requirements of the ordinance. I believe uh, from my memory under the current ordinance, there's a process already provided for transferring that permit. So I'm not sure that we sitting here today could, um, let's see, I believe the provision requires that so many days in advance, there has to be an application to transfer that conditional use permit under the current ordinance. So let me grab. So the condition that you want to pose is specifically that. Specifically that if ownership of the property changes, the conditional the, the conditional use permit for a vacation home rental ceases to exist. Uh, I believe that would be contrary to our current current ordinance. There is a provision under that ordinance that specifically provides that conditional use permits for VHRs in general agriculture, limited agriculture, low density residential and sur suburban shall be allowed to be transferred if the following conditions are met. And then there's conditions including prior notice um, to the planning department. So I, I think, I don't think, Legally, we would be um, you'd be allowed to impose the termination. But under the rules of a conditional use permit, period, 
we're allowed to put additional restrictions on? Yes, the nature of a conditional use permit is that you can impose reasonable conditions, but my hesitancy is that the condition you're proposing here is, is clearly contrary to our current ordinance. Okay. An attempt to provide protection, but... Well, and the VHR ordinance is something that we will be revisiting um, in the near future as we rework our ordinances. But that would be my concern, is that we're we're going directly contrary to our current ordinance. Very good. Um, I have a comment. Go ahead, Sandy. And, and that is, the current owner approves the cancellation of the conditional use permit in the event he were to sell. So he stood up here and said he would have no problem with that happening. And the only difference is the new owner would then have to come in and apply. But it wouldn't and be an automatic transfer. Might change his mind. <clears throat> he might, you know, that happens. People who, change their mind. Who might change their mind? Well, the current owner might change his mind. He, he might not want that kind of a restriction. Oh, I see. And, um, and I would anticipate that Mr. LaCroix uh, is being very forthright and honest in, in his uh, expressing his feelings and his intentions. I don't doubt that. but. Times change, situations change, and I don't think so much the people uh, here today are going to be protected by the very nature of uh, Mr. LaCroix's ownership and his intention, which is to eventually move into this place. You're fortunate to, as we've said before, to have a good neighbor and a good landowner and a good, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, person next who, who, who will behave, I think, in a positive and constructive way. But I, I just the idea that we've made this for this one moment and circumstance, I'm uncomfortable with. And yeah. I point out that we have criteria within our conditional use ordinance that talks about the types of um, factors that the Planning Commission should consider in approving or denying a conditional use. So this commission, as you consider this particular request, really should be focusing on those particular factors and whether uh, VHR is even appropriate. Because yes, they've met the criteria, but it's still conditional use. And if under any of those factors, this commission feels the uh, VHR should not be uh, approved, you may do that. But you should really consider this particular application under those particular factors. Okay. I believe that we've come to the conclusion that it's appropriate. However, we were uh, attempting to put some additional protection on it. Um, however, if that is the case and it legally or uh, it's going to cause problems for us in the future, then I would withdraw my uh, recommendation that we put that additional condition on and then I would simply move for approval of the, condi of the uh, conditional use permit. Second. And that is without item 14. Without item 14. Okay. Okay. Is everyone clear on the motion? <laughs> so the motion is for approval of conditional use permit 1934 with conditions listed with 15 conditions. with 15 conditions. Correct. Getting rid of item number 14. Clear? All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? No. Motion carries. Brings us to item number 10. Agenda item number 10 is rezone 1917 and comprehensive plan amendment 1917. The applicants are David and Mary Grover. Applicants have submitted a request to rezone 12.83 acres from general agriculture district to low density residential district. Applicants are also requesting to amend the Pennington County comprehensive plan change from future land use from planned unit development sensitive district to low density residential district. The applicants intend to subdivide the subject property into four lots and none will meet the lot size for the current zoning. As it sits today, the property is zoned general agriculture district, which carries with it a 40 acre lot size minimum. Lot size now is 12.83 acres. Access is off of Old Hill City Road. There is no special flood hazard area on the property, no structures on the property. However, there is a conventional wastewater treatment system from a previously existing structure. 
Current zoning within one mile includes general agriculture district, limited agriculture district, low density residential district, the city of Hill City limits, and highway service district. Future land use within one mile includes public land, planned unit development sensitive district, low density residential district, the city of Hill City limits, as well as highway service district. The applicants have requested to change the future land use of the subject property from planned unit development sensitive to low resident dense, low resident, low density residential district. Uh, staff analysis is that there are several properties with low density residential district future land use designations within one mile of the subject property to include three that border the property line to the east as you can see on the slide above. On September, a little history here, a little, on September 2019, the Board of Commissioners approved Minor Plat MPL 1919 to create the subject property. <laughs> Approval of this request will satisfy condition number three of that Minor Plat, bringing the subject in property into compliance with the Pennington County Zoning Ordinance. The applicant's request to rezone appears to be in harmony with the current and future land use in the area. Therefore, staff recommends approval of rezone and comprehensive plan amendment 1917. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff on this item? Seeing none, are there any questions from the audience? Any members of the audience that wish to speak on this item? Can, can you come up to the to the front and state your name for the record? We'll get your questions answered. Uh, Melissa Chrisman, and I was just wondering what the property size is. I didn't hear. Twelve point three acres. acres. So each additional lot, when they break it up, it will be twelve acres. No, ma'am. So what are, what's what's what do they want to break it up into? Be it looks about to, according to their plan that they submitted along with this application, it looks to be about three between three and three point five acres for each lot. So there will be an additional how many potential homes in that area? Four. Four more. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's what I wanted to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Any uh, further requests to speak on this item from folks in the uh, seeing none? Did you raise your hand, ma'am? Okay. Um, seeing none, um, staff is recommending approval of rezone 1917 uh, and comprehensive plan amendment CA 1917. Is there a motion? So move. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Kathy. I, um, <clears throat> you know, this is just right adjoining the issue we, the, the conditional use permit for the VHR property. And then, of course, you know, I'm just right down the road. And, you know, I, I don't like the idea of these, you know, creating these a bunch more small lots. I mean, and, to, and out there, three acres is a small lot. And, and I know that that um, the planning commission and the ordinance and our board, we really can't address things like water supply. But that's the issue out there is, you know, drilling enough wells to supply water to all of these people. And I know that, you know, when, when we moved in um, in 2002, when we purchased that, the recognition there was that, in the, you know, to, to take a longer view, you know, you really needed, you know, 10 acre lots to make sure that the water supply was adequate for all the residents. And it's, you know, you talk to anybody who lives out there and, you know, water supply is, is an issue. And, um, but right now, and I know that we're not supposed to address that because it's not part of our ordinance, it's not a requirement. You know, septic is, but not, uh, not water supply. But that doesn't mean that it, it's not a concern. And, um, so I don't, I understand clearly the, that there's, there's small lots just right up the way, you know, the, the Ford Mountain lots are, you know, this size. And so it certainly meets the requirement that there's a number of these small three acre lots, three plus a little bit, you know, in the area. But I just, I'm, I just am uncomfortable with uh, subdividing it into the, into those smaller lots. Yeah, just to clarify, he hasn't submitted the layout plan for that. Uh, I know, that's just stating I know his but that is certainly the request. stated intention. And I understand that, that they really aren't there. And uh, that this is just really to change the, um, to you know, for rezoning. Correct. Mm -hmm. 
we have a question from the audience, sir. Do you want to come forward and? State your name for the record. My name is uh, David Grover, and the reason I am uh, have uh, had put this request in to do the different lots is because of of your, uh, you know, as you said, in your paint the county zoning ordinance under 207 LDR that the uh, uh, minimum lot size is three acres exclusive of dedicated public streets and private and a plot of private drives. And so basically what I'm doing is complying to your ordinance. You know, I, I appreciate your personal opinion, but that is your personal opinion, yeah. you know, you, you know. And as far as uh, water, I understand uh, that also. But the thing is, is if a person has a water issue, they really only need to drill deeper. And then basically that is at a cost, but that would be, you know, at a cost uh, to, to the landowner, who is me at this point. Anyway, it's just kind of, and, and um, you know, uh, <laughs> I wasn't gonna say this, but uh, the reason I'm doing this is, uh, it's for, for, I'm dividing that land into which is, I'm, according to this ordinance, I'm legal to do, but I'm also doing it because I have, just I happen to have four kids. And, hmm. you know, I don't know that any of them, I know two of them probably will never ever live out there because they're, they're, they're far away. They've moved to other parts of the country. But, I just, uh, it's just one of those things. That's where I, that's why I'm actually trying to get that divided. And, and I'm, I feel that I'm within the legal, uh, qual you know, w with your, with your ordinance. Okay. That's what it comes down to. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Kathy. I, yes, I agree with you that this certainly, the our ordinance allows for this uh, without question. It's, but, it doesn't mean that you you must subdivide. You can still have a rezone into uh, low density residential and have larger than three acre lots. So it's not as though you are compelled to do this yeah, if we I approve totally, the rezone. Yeah, I totally understand. And, and that. you and you really should talk to other additional well drillers because it's not true out there that all you need to do is go deeper and you're going to get more water because our water out there is all controlled by fracture flows. Mm -hmm. And the deeper you go, the fewer fractures you have to fill up with water. So it's not like your typical aquifers that you find you know, out on the prairie and so on. So it is a little different deal. Yeah, and, I, and I, you're, you're, you could be right on that. Uh, you won't actually know until you actually drill. That's right. Any further questions for Mr. Grover? Thank you, sir. Anything further from, uh, any further questions on this item? Seeing none, um, I believe that we had a motion and a second and we were on further discussion. Uh, and that, that motion and second was for approval of rezone 1917 and comprehensive plan amendment 1917. Um, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no? No. Uh, one no. Motion carries. Item 11. Item 11, you have seen this property on several occasions. It's a conditional use permit to allow a specialty resort in a general agriculture district. Uh, this applicant is requesting this conditional use permit um, within the existing residence, which currently has two distinct units within it. The applicant has a conditional use permit for a multifamily residence and another conditional use permit to allow one of the units to be utilized as a VHR. Uh, the state of South Dakota Administrative Rule 4402501 defines a specialty resort as any bed and breakfast establishment, 
except if and breakfast established as defined in a different section of the administrative rule, lodge, dude ranch, resort, building, or buildings used to provide accommodations or recreation for a charge to the public with no more than 10 rental units for up to an average of 20 guests per night in which meals are provided to only guests staying in the specialty resort. Our ordinance does not define a specialty resort, so we are deferring to the state's administrative rules for that definition. As the property exists today, it consists of 1.77 acres. It is in General Agriculture District. There is access to the property off of um, South Highway 385. Um, it does go through Forest Service lands, and they are working with uh, the Forest Service to secure a current FLMPA, or excuse me, FLPMA private road easement. Um, there is a 10-foot driveway that exists, and it does, excuse me provide access to both units. The lot does contain a, sorry, it should be a multifamily residence, an on-site wastewater treatment system, and they did upgrade their on-site wastewater treatment system. I believe if you had remembered before, they had asked to have a vacation home rental in both units of this structure, and the um, on-site wastewater treatment system was not adequate um, to provide up to 10 guests in which the property owner has requested. So they did do the upgrade to that, which was approved by our on-site wastewater specialist um, and it is installed. And they did have received um, approval from DENR for 10 guests in the specialty resort for their septic system. So there is special flood hazard area on this property, including floodway. Um, like I said, there is a lot of history on this property. Uh, he did, um, we, this board did recommend denial of that second VHR. He did um, appeal that to the Board of Commissioners. The Board of Commissioners allowed him to continue the use of his vacation home rental for up to a year. Uh, so we have been working with this property owner to try to bring this property into compliance and for him to be able to utilize this as a specialty resort so he could um, rent it for up to 10 people. Uh, the other caveat is this is the way that the vacation home rental is defined in um, the state statute is that the vacation home rental has to be rented in its entirety. And because he had two units, he wanted to be able to um, stay in the top unit if he came out for the weekend and still utilize the uh, bottom unit as a vacation home rental. Um, so working with the state's attorney's office and, and the applicant, uh, we had determined that a specialty resort would be the best bet for him to be in line with our ordinance and to meet his um, what he was asking for to utilize his property. So staff is uh, recommending approval of this conditional use permit with conditions. Questions for staff? Seeing none, is there uh, anybody in the audience that wishes to speak on this issue? Seeing none, uh, recommendation from staff is uh, to approve conditional use permit 1838, and there are 16 conditions. I would entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Motion and second for approval. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Item 12. Um, item 12 is a motion to schedule a hearing of the Pennington County Comprehensive Plan view to 2040 to amend and supersede Pennington County's existing comprehensive plan. The Board of Commissioners did make some changes to the comprehensive plan. Um, we are working with a consultant at this time um, to implement those changes in the document. So we have a final document. Um, so that final document uh, will go in front of you guys for approval and then in front of the Board of Commissioners for approval. So we are looking for a motion um, so that Jerry can get those on calendar and get those hearings scheduled. To approve um, the hearings. Second. <coughs> motion and second. Further discussion? I have some questions. Yes. We'll start with you, Sandy. When does this end? <laughs> I mean, while the Planning Commission gave the recommendations, Correct. the County Commissioners made their changes. Correct. And that's going to come back to us. As the final document with I no changes. I understand, but mm -hmm. if we have a change, then we'll go back to the Commissioners and then, I mean, like say, when does it end? We're just setting a date, aren't we? Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. <laughs> uh, 
It's on the uh, state's attorney's office recommendation that this final document be reviewed by this planning commission. Uh, publication of notice is not just a matter of whether the public can be present, but also that the public is able to be adequately informed as to the nature of the changes and the proposed plan. Given the importance of the comprehensive plan, because everything flows from the comprehensive plan, it's, it's really very important that the public has an opportunity to review the final document and weigh in. So this should be the last time that you will be asked to consider the comprehensive plan, and then it will be um, forwarded to the board for final approval by resolution. Okay. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Well, I, I don't want to beat a dead horse. Um, so, but if it were to come back to us, and if we were to make changes, then will this process continue? You're only going to be re requested to review the changes as made by the Board of Commissioners, nothing more for your final approval, and give the public an opportunity to weigh in on those proposed changes. So maybe, maybe not, is what I'm hearing. Kathy. That's my question. Will we get a red line version of this so we know what changes that we yes. need to review? Yes. For instance, one of the significant changes is that, um, based upon board discussion, plan unit developments will be allowed, but they will be allowed as an overlay to existing zoning districts. They will not be allowed as an independent district. That's a very significant change. And yes, you will get a red line version. You will be requested to review only the changes as made by the board. Further questions before I get to my questions? All right, so the motion was to schedule that hearing. Do we need to come up with the specifics in that motion? The dates would be just one date. Just one date. Um, so if you did February 10th or February 24th, then it would go to the Board of Commissioners on February 18th and March 3rd or February, or excuse me, March 3rd and March 17th. So if you scheduled that February date, then it would be in front of the board in March. Okay. Do we need to make that as, as a formal part of the motion? Pardon? Do we need to have the February 10th as a formal part of the motion? Yes, I would prefer if we had February 24th, oh. and then the board hearings could be March 3rd and March 17th. I was just about to ask, is that enough time for the advertisement? So since you said the, the later February date, I think that is. Okay. So the motion then would be a uh, motion to schedule a hearing on February 24th of the draft Pennington County Comprehensive Plan, view to 2040 for final review and approval. Is that okay with the motion in the second? Yes, it is. Yes? Okay. Um, are there any uh, questions from the audience, comments? Anyone wishes to speak on that motion? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Motion carries. Brings us to the construction permit agenda items. Item 13. Uh, Good morning, Cody Sack, uh, Environmental Planner. The following items have been placed on the construction permit agenda to be heard for the public comment. It will not be voted on by the Planning Commission. Any Planning Commissioner, staff member, or audience member may comment on any of the items. Comments received will be considered by the Planning Director who will make the final decision on the construction permit. Would you like me to go through them or? No, I, I don't think so. So are, are there any questions um, from the membership on item number 13? Are there any questions from anyone in the audience or anyone wish to speak on item 13? Please come forth. State your name for the record. Kathy Hennis. I own the property at the end of Beth Page, and we had received notice that there uh, was a potential for the um, electrical substation going in. And my question is, is where the access road would be going to that plant? It appears that the access road comes off Sheridan Lake Road, doesn't it? Uh, yes. From what they submitted for, uh, to us was this. If you go to the first page in the plans, it's on the first page of the plans for, for this, the access easement. So this dotted line right here, they'll come up from here, and then they're going to be building a, constructing an access road up there. And no plans as it come off Beth Page. Okay. Thank you. 
Any further questions from anybody in the audience on this item? Thank you. Brings us to item 14. Is there any specific questions on? Well, let me get there. Any questions from anybody on the commission? Item 14, seeing none. Is there any questions from anybody in the audience on item 14? Seeing none, uh, we will move on to item 15. So item 15 is a county board report. The Board of Commissioners concurred with the Planning Commission's recommendation from the December 2nd, 2019 and the December 16th, 2019 Planning Commission meetings. Thank you. Are there any questions on that? Okay. Next item on the agenda is items from the public. And I do have a speaker request form here from uh, Jerry Matson uh, regarding the Marvin HOA and the, and the mining operations. Good morning, Jerry Matson, 3875 Marvin Road. I own the 15 acre parcel directly southeast of the 40 acres that's current, currently under a mining operation. Um, so therefore we get the prevailing northwesterly winds coming right down my driveway. Um, every time you open up the door, we get a glut of dust. It's thick, mm. it's not healthy. It's a combination of clay, gypsum, silica dust, spent diesel fuel, you name it, whatever that wind can pick up, it's pumping right inside our house. I've got a couple of photographs. I don't know if Mark loaded them on into the uh, file for the computer so you can see it or not. Well, the only ones <coughs> dust through these ones. Yeah, that's not mine. So, <coughs> those are the ones we received. Right, I downloaded one this morning to Mark. I don't know if uh, it'll be up here or not. But um, we're inhaling this stuff, and I don't think we're ever informed by registered mail what was going on down here. At least I wasn't, and I don't think anybody else was either. Um, we haven't seen a, uh, a plan of what's happening here whatsoever. Um, I've attended the last two meetings, and I have noticed that uh, some mining ordinances were being amended. Um, I think that might be a little after the fact. Um, I'd like to refer to uh, section 100 and 101 where Pennington County Ordinance promotes the health, safety, morals, and welfare of the general public. This operation, if it did not follow proper protocol in obtaining the permits, I'd like to know, is it a valid permit? Bottom line, um, I think, why should our health be jeopardized? The whole subdivision, this is not just myself. It's a unanimous problem for the entire subdivision. I'd like to see it addressed and dealt with in, in a proper manner. All the proper procedures followed, just like I have to do. When this property came up for sale, the 40 acres, I told my wife, let's go see about buying that. It'd be a perfect spot to put in 40 RV sites. No, we have a homeowners association covenant saying we can't do anything commercial here. So well, I guess that changed our mind, didn't it? But now somebody else can come in and do this and jeopardize my health. Oh, come on, where does it stop? I'd like you all to look at this very hard. Thank you for your time. Mr. Chairman, go ahead. Can we get a map Travis. so we can see an idea of what, what's mining operations in the area and where this is located? And I guess the second question to that is, is this a recent uh, mining application? Uh, back in this early December. And the contiguous landowners were not notified? Uh, construction permits and mining permits under 507B are not required to notify neighbors by certified mail. I'm sorry, what? Uh, construction permits and mining permits are not required to send notifications to adjoining properties. Thank you. 
I want to, Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. I believe Cody indicated earlier, but that's on a, under 507B. Once the new ordinance, 320, dealing with aggregate mining, is valid, and that's 20 days from date of publication, uh, then there will be required notification with regard to mining permits. But under the old ordinance, there's not. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. Um, Go ahead. I have a question for Cody. Is is this the is this the situation where um, they were just going to remove some gypsum deposits and so on in a is part of a larger construction operation? Uh, yes, correct. Now, am I remembering this right that the that the they really uh, Mr. Shad wasn't required to get a mining permit because of the, the volume or the size, the footprint somehow of that gypsum deposit? Yeah, so under 507, oh sorry, under 507B, um, if you're excavating more than 100 cubic yards of material, um, regardless of the material, you have to get a mining permit. So when he came in for the construction permit, since he was removing that, he was required to get the mining permit. Um, we've talked with the state, the state is not requiring a state mining permit because he doesn't meet their guidelines, but he met our definition of removing that 100 cubic yards. I see. So the, it, it, the volume was such that it would have triggered the 507 if it would have been in place? If, it, if he wasn't removing that material from the site, he would have just been required to have a construction permit, not a mining permit. Okay, but, but the... But him removing that gypsum off site requires a mining permit under 507B. Yeah. Okay, but that's not in place right now, is that right? Yes, because of the, the process that, that has been, that's gone on for that. Correct. Yeah, I see, okay. Uh, <coughs> Go ahead, Jim. So how long is he gonna be, you know, operating? Is this a short-term deal? Is this gonna be over in a year or six months or what? He informed staff that he could have all the, most of the, sorry, not all, most of the gypsum and most of the hauling done by March. Okay, so. The, and that's just because he has to, he's just drilling right now. Um, we have, he has mentioned blasting, which he would be out, he said he could be out in two weeks if he blasted the gypsum out. Is he subject to some kind of regulation in terms of uh, dust and, and uh, under under the construction permit, yes. Um, and I think if you look on the agenda, it actually there's uh, items from staff that are going to be addressed. Some yes, of the history is. behind it is going to be presented to you guys later. Um, oh, I think we're under public, item 17. Yeah, I think we're under public comment right now. So, oh, okay. So we'll go through some of those items then. So, but if these landowners adjacent to this property have have concerns about dust and and issues like that, um, they they have come. They can come to your office. They can file complaints. Uh, that will that should trigger some sort of review and, and enforcement of the mm -hmm. requirements under the construction permit and or mining permit. That's correct. And then under item 17, we'll discuss that. There's I just recently did a site visit and I'm working on the, our inspection report that we do. Okay. He's going to be required to do several things to mitigate the dust um, that he's going to be required or a stop or work order will be issued on the property. Thank but, you. But is he operating right now? Yes. Yes. And the dust is rolling and <clears throat> we're waiting to get you know, some kind of bureaucratic judgment before we say, hey, that's too much dust or what? I, I, I'm really confused and I think the constituents back there <laughs> even more so. I mean, I don't quite see what, how this unfolds. <laughs> Chairman, let's go back. Let's uh, go on to, uh, so I'll let you answer that. Sir, I'll, we'll come back to you um, after the questions are done with Cody. Go, go ahead, Cody, answer Jim, and then we'll go to Travis. So should I answer now or should, since this is public comment and I'm not That's correct. technically well, actually, public. Point of order. I, I was going to, that's what I was kind of going to get at right. is since we're addressing this after the item, uh, the, uh, you're, the items you're in the public. We should, we should do this during item 17. Right. But also allow them to come up and speak on it during that time too, since it's not a normal time that we'd allow them to speak, you know. So that's, that's, that's fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. 
Are there any other items from the public? And I guess I would make the note that uh, we'll be bringing this item up in uh, agenda item 17B. Yes. Seeing none, uh, we will move on to item 17. So that brings us to 17A, building permit report. So the building permit report, it looks like our number of building permits are, were down. Um, however, our valuation is up significantly. So that's kind of the gist of that one. Very good. And then I do have a C and a D uh, for items from staff also. Mr. Chairman, is it possible that we could move C and D above B since it sounds like we could be spending time with B a little bit longer? That way we can knock those two quick ones out if they're quick and then address B. Well, I'd like to get the hear the folks first. Okay. So and then we'll take those. Um, so now we're on item 17B and I guess uh, Cody maybe if you could come up and kind of run through maybe a sequence of the conversations that you've had thus far and bring everyone on the board here up to date. And then we'll take uh, questions from the audience members. All right, so Cody Sack, environmental planner. Uh, we'll pull some pictures up so you guys can see kind of better what um, is going on there. Oh, you have them all down here. Oh, okay. Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. While Cody is bringing up that information, there is a lot of background to this particular issue that I think um, Cody can fill you in uh, on. First of all, my understanding is that the gypsum is not being removed pursuant to any type of commercial activity. It was the result of a request by another property owner. There's prov provisions in their covenants that... Uh, the property owner was complying with at the request of an adjoining property owner, which had to do with whether the uh, building that was going to be on site would be visible. The uh, uh, Another uh, property owner in this HOA specifically requests that there be less visibility, which in, involved then removing the gypsum so that there would be lower visibility of the particular structure that was going to be input uh, put in place. After that, that particular property owner approached several times the planning department, state's attorney's office, not complaining about dust, but complaining about some damage to the road. That, unfortunately, uh, is really an issue dealing with the HOA and its private covenants to attempt to explain that uh, the county is not in a position or place to enforce private covenants. It was after that fact then there became complaints of dust. Uh, the mining permit really is a non-issue. It was required because of the disturbance of the gypsum over 100 cubic yards. 100 cubic yards. In fact, under the new ordinance that's coming forth, it wouldn't even require a mining permit. What's at issue here is really the construction permit and um, the protections that are involved under the construction ordinance dealing with the types of things that, uh, to prevent unnecessary erosion th through air or water. Thank you. Michelle, to clarify, the road that's being disturbed is not a county road, it is a private road? My understanding is it is part of the HOA that the county has not assumed responsibility for that road. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I get a map of the, you had the map <coughs> up of the, of the uh, mining area, but can we get an idea of where the impacted um, properties are? So the one highlighted right here is where the work is being done. Uh, the neighbors would be that are here today would be south, which would be these lots. They're along the road on the way out to the to the highway. Okay. So go ahead, Cody, with your pictures or what you've uh, reviewed. Um, so he does have, you know, you, you'll see in the pictures, he does have quite a bit disturbed and he does need to do dust control and to go with Commissioner Coleman's question on on the dust control there is, it does need to be done. Um, 
right now. However, you know, we have to, and we've told him that, but with that report, you have to give them a certain amount of time to get it done. Uh, there's a process with it, like we do with all of our other construction permits. Um, we try to give a little leeway, and if you don't do it, then you then you get the stop work order. But they've been notified that there are issues. There's dust issues. There's erosion. There, there has been. So the the first report that I did, I said that he had to do dust control mitigation. Um, obviously, that hasn't worked. Uh, so we move on to stricter things, such as he needs to either tackify all of his stockpiles that he has there, or put straw mat or straw down to keep it from the dust from blowing. Okay. Do you have any further items to go over? Um, I know that on this is the board, because um, this item has been brought in front of the board several times, that um, it will be in front of the Board of Commissioners on the 21st, so next Tuesday, and that there is, um, do you want to talk about Vaughn? There has been some request um, for some bonding or um, other stipulations to be put on these permits. Um, a timeline, I guess that's the biggest thing is the timeline. Um, staff has been out there um, multiple times, at least four or five inspections with the property owner has been out there. Um, I know two of the board of commissioners have been out there. Um, we're working with him. Um, he has come in and talked to us about trying to do the blasting um, to get it out quicker so he can be done faster. Um, I did um, recommend to him that he speak with the property owners prior to doing something like that just so um, they're not getting notification from a blaster and having no idea um, that that's happening. Um, so there is some, you know, communication, I think, um, that needs to happen a little bit between the homeowners up there and him. We, ha we go out there weekly, um, at least weekly. Um, Cody's out there, um, if not with another staff member, on a weekly basis um, working with him uh, to try to get it into compliance. So. Okay. And, and how have the conversations between the landowner and the homeowners gone? Have you been, have you been party to any of those conversations? Uh, no. Okay. Mr. Thank you. Go ahead, Kathy. So given the, your procedure for, um, you know, first recognizing a problem and then talking to the landowner and, you know, that whole process that where, how, where are you relative in that process to which you'd say, uh, stop work? So what we do is we identify a problem, we come up with a solution. If that solution doesn't work, we try to give them another solution, which would be that tackifier and those erosion control mats. Um, if he did, if he doesn't implement those or anything, that's where the stop work order will come into effect. Um, and if it doesn't work, something else will have to be, and we'll have to come up with it as well. So the responsibility of coming up with a fix is on you? No, it's on the no. no. No, we just, there's, in the, in the stormwater manual, there are um, different things that you can do, and we give people the guidance to go do that, or we give them suggestions. We don't physically tell them what they need to do. Um, however, we can put in, like, my inspection report, I can put that he needs to implement either, like, tackify or straw mats. It's up to him at that point which one he wants to do. If one doesn't work, he'd have to do the other. I believe that the planning department has been working diligently at trying to get this resolved ever since they knew about the complaint. Um, it, and I guess Kathy's question is, is do we have a specific end date that if he doesn't get this taken care of, he stops? Is there a specific end date? No, we don't. Um, the other problem with some of these construction sites is, that's difficult is if we do do a stop work order and he pulls off site and it's in this condition, it isn't really doing anyone any good. I'm trying to get it shored up and um, brought into compliance um, is, is a better fix. And that's why on these construction sites, we try to work with the property owners. We stay diligently on them multiple times a week, speaking with the, the neighbors and uh, the con and the um, contractor, like I said, it's very difficult if we do a stop work order and he pulls off site and just leaves it like this. Then the dust doesn't stop. Then nothing, it doesn't really fi is fixed. Correct. So th that's why we really try to work 
um, on trying to bring them into compliance the best we can. Our only other option is, you know, essentially going through a statutory process, taking them to court, declaring it a nuisance, and going in and abating it. Although one so thing that, that, that's kind of the other. One thing that would stop that is causing quite a bit of the dust from what I could see when I went out there is the traffic would stop. I mean, if he pulls out right. and quits, then he's no longer disturbing the ground via his equipment or the vehicles removing the equipment. So, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Travis. If there is a stop work order, and I get what you're saying, if he just decides to pull out and not stabilize or do anything there, then what it, What can we do moving forward at that point? Because obviously, if, if it's still causing a nuisance, it's still causing a problem, there's got to be a process that we would move forward with. Right, and that would be through uh, an abatement process, through getting either an order from the court or the Board of Commissioners to abate it. And so if we told them to stop work, I don't know, let's just say by the end of January or whatever, um, how long would it take to get that moving forward? It depends. <laughs> it could take, you know, a month or so. I'm trying to think the last abatement that we did, it, it, it took some time um, to get it abated. Um, so it's, you know, it has to go through a process. You're using public funds, then you're putting an assessment on a property. And, you know, so, that, so there's some different things. Um, the other issue um, with this, this is a contract for deed. Uh, so the property owner right now um, and the contractor are under a contract for deed. So the property owner that owns it right now as not the contract for deed holder, he did sign the applications and things. So um, if the contractor pulls out, we would have to um, look at the property owner also. Yep. So, Go ahead, Michelle, Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. I'd like to point out there'd be a difference between um, whether the planning department could issue a stop work order and what would be involved in terms of a court ordered abatement. So I think there would be a possibility where the planning department could issue a stop work order in terms of going in and remedying maybe um, existing issues um, with the property that might be a nuisance that's separate. Thank you. Any further questions for staff before we take questions from the audience? Okay. Um, sir, if you wanted to come back up, Jerry. <clears throat> Jerry Matson. I do have a photograph I just took this morning in my garage. I'd like to share it with you. <laughs> I didn't get a chance to get it on the overhead screen, but I'd just like to pass it around if you don't mind. The seat of my car was garage, that's what we're breathing in every day. Yep. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> That's what comes in my, my door every time we walk in and out of our house. Hmm. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Travis. It, just out of curiosity from those who are here on this item, uh, when did y'all start seeing all this dust? When was the first time that you started seeing a lot of this dust? <laughs> yeah. And I guess I would, I would prefer people come up one at a time and we can go through questions and answers. My name is Mark Wiley. I live in Marvin Subdivision, 3901 Marvin Road. And I'd like to show you some additional pictures here. I know we got through some of them. Uh, okay, here's, uh, here you can see a, a picture of a truck hauling. That's a truck and pipe. Here's a better picture of it. That road is 18 feet wide. In some spots it's 16 feet wide. So. I'm in the construction business, and that's, that's something you don't do. The liability is huge. And here the truck is pulling on the scale at GCCC. And, of course, I can't go in there and take a look because I'm not admitted to that location. This is Jessica's backyard. She lives, I don't know if you guys have a plat. She's one of the second landowners back. Okay, Jessica would live right here where that cursor is. Bob Watts lives here. 
these two properties are most impacted. They have a huge amount of dust on their property. And of course, we just had a recent blizzard and, and of course they come out the back door and they stepped in mud, basically what's happening. So the prevailing winds come this direction through this area. So it just inundates people with dirt. When, I, when we first met Kobe and talked to him, basically what he wanted to do is he was gonna put a pole barn in for his toys. That's what he was gonna do. Well, he, he's excavated from here about clear out to here to extract jip. You don't do that just to prep a building site. He's also on the top of this hill, opened up the top. So my concern is, and everybody's concern is, when is it, when is it gonna stop? According to the building permit, he could do this for the next three or four years. And, and our property values uh, up there are gonna be reduced anywhere from 25 to 30%. My next question is, if, if this is an ongoing thing, then our, our property value is gonna be reevaluated re concerning taxes. And the road itself, when spring breakup comes and he hauls, he's gonna destroy our road. And it's a private road, we can't keep anybody off, it's dedicated easement, so we can't even put load limits on it. So these are all concerns that we wouldn't have to be addressing had that permit not been allowed. And basically here on 320 and on 507B, uh, you know, the natural resources in a manner compatible with neighboring land uses. Well, this is not compatible with a residential neighborhood. So I'd like you to consider doing something about this situation. I don't think it's gonna go away on its own. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. So I guess I would just add that I don't think that 320 was in force. No, it wasn't. It was 507B. 507B, which yeah. is kind of an open slot. Right. Which allowed him to get in there. And that's what needs to be mitigated, if we can do it. Because we're kind of victims here. We were living our life, enjoying life, and all of a sudden, boom. Thank you. Any, any other questions? I'll open it up. Any questions? Go ahead, I, Travis. I do, but I think it's going to be for Brittany because something's going through my mind here. Is there contracts for like road hauling? If I remember correctly, if a, if, a, if a hauler is going through private property, don't they have to get road contracts or something of that nature if they cause damage? There's no road district there, and the city of Rapid City didn't require one because they go on to Universal Drive and Deadwood Avenue in Rapid City, which is built to handle the trucks because the trucks from Pete Lean and GCC use those roads. Um, so normally if there would have been, you know, a road district or anything, there's nothing on that. There's nothing that... Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. Initially, when Mr. Wiley approached the Planning Department, he indicated that this road was the subject of a road district. It is not. It subsequently was verified that the road is part parcel of rules governed by the Homeowners Association. I did advise Mr. Wiley that um, they might take a second look at the rules um, under the Homeowners Association, certainly the Homeowners Association can amend the, those rules, impose other rules. My understanding is Mr. Shad is, he owns property and that property is part of this Homeowners Association. So they can't preclude him from using that road, but certainly they would be able to look at some of the other rules that apply as well as potentially seeking damages against Mr. Cody for damage to the road. I also inform Mr. Wiley that because this is a private legal matter, matter I recommended that he seek private legal counsel to determine um, uh, what, what his remedies would be in terms of addressing the road damage. Thank also, you. Also, I'd like to add, we wouldn't be needing legal counsel if this wasn't permitted. Okay. So that's all I got to say. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody? Yes, sir. Please come forward. you state your name for the record. My name is Thomas Cantor. I live at 3910 Marvin Road. <clears throat> I just have two, maybe three things I just want to bring up real quick. One of the things, uh, I thought there was a moratorium on mining permits in Pennington County because there was no ordinance in place because it has not been passed. So if that was the case, when did that moratorium get lifted and for what reason? That's question number one. Question number two is when you come in and you get a, like when I went in and got my building permit for my pole barn on my property, I laid out a map of where I was gonna put this building, gave all the 
you know, measurements and was all there stated. Mr. Shad is building the, my understanding is the building's gonna be down in the southwest corner of his property. The, or southeast, excuse me, the southeast corner, which is where he dug 20, 25 feet down to get that building below the sight line from the rest of us, I understand that. So if that's the case, why is he up on the southwest corner jipping or mining all that jip out of there? What purpose is that other than just to disrupt the ground? So that's question number two. And question number three is that building permit slash mining permit, grading permit, is that just his entire 40 acres? He can just go in there and just do whatever he wants? I mean, there's a lot more jip up there than just what what he's already disturbed in those two spots. So can you go down the backside and start digging down there too? I mean, when, when you get your permit, don't you have to lay that stuff out? What you're gonna do and... So that's my three questions. If you could answer those questions, I'd be much obliged. Okay. Any questions for well, me? Well, uh, any questions for the gentleman? Okay. Michelle, if you could try to answer the questions about the moratorium on the on the on the mining permits, I, I know that that's come up. Thank you, Michelle Hoffman, State's Attorney's Office. The moratorium ended uh, two years ago, I believe, around April of 2018. At the time, the original uh, aggregate mining ordinance was adopted. When the Supreme Court invalidated, um, that was Ordinance Amendment 1702, um, the end result of that is the pre-existing ordinance then is in effect. Yeah. So three, th bottom line is 320 superseded the old ordinance. When the Supreme Court threw out the new ordinance, the old ordinance is still in place and that is 507B. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then the question about the pole barn and uh, the excavation limits for the mining versus the construction permit. Can you tackle that one, Cody? I'll try to answer just a couple things. When he did submit a site plan, he showed, and it's hard to see on here, he showed us two separate sites that he wanted to build on. Um, and we spoke to him at length about this property um, because there is a, an exception in our ordinance um, on page 201, uh, it does say that a construction permit is not required if, a con if construction activity is related to an approved building permit. So if he would have came in and got the two building permits without doing the construction activity, uh, Cody and I worked with Mr. Shad and said, you know, we really think that this is just, um, you know, the type the excavation that he's doing and things um, that we would prefer you to get a construction permit um, than rather just get the building permits first. Um, and he agreed to that. So I just want you guys to be aware that, um, you know, our ordinance does have that exception in it. Um, and he, so he's been working with us. Like I said, we speak to him um, quite often, um, multiple times per week. Uh, we've been working with him on this property to try to, um, you know, try to facilitate, you know, what he's doing and also find, you know, protections in place for the other people. Um, but I just want you to be aware of that. That's why those building permits were not um, pulled first, um, that he went with a construction permit first. So where's the area that he's building his barn? Um, there's one going in here and then there was one going over here. So that would, there was two. That was his um, comments to us. And the third question was regarding the entire 40 acres for the mining permit. We don't have any limitations on the amount of disturbance. We have a minimum, but we do not have a maximum. But the disturbance is controlled by the by the construction permit. Correct. Just, okay. Just to follow up on that. So Go ahead, Kathy. The, so to expand the construction, the disturbance mm -hmm. beyond those two areas that have been identified in the current construction permit, it would require an, an additional construction permit or an update of that? It would just require an update of it. Um, this is kind of the plan. He shows some different you know, flattening. He wants to flatten out that area. Uh, Cody and I have talked at length about him trying to just finish up on that one side, get it seated, get it stabilized, um, get something down, and then move over to the other side. Um, that's what we're going to try to work with him on, trying to get that done so there's not so much of it's opened up. 
at do once. You, <clears throat> so do you know if the neighbors know the, the what the current construction permit covers and that anything beyond that would require an, an update or an amendment to it? Um, yes, they have done a records request and gotten the information, our staff reports and things for this. Uh, like I said, he shows on his site plan that he's grading quite a bit of this out. Mm -hmm. um, he planned on making it flatter and more usable, mm -hmm. is what he had indicated to staff. But that's, that's well established, really, given the site plan that is the basis for the construction permit. Correct. Yeah. And like I said, we don't have a maximum. Um, the state has different, you know, right. like guides to it, like acres and five acres, and they have different things that are required, but we do not. We just have the minimum 10,000 square feet. Yes. But I mean, even though you don't have a maximum that once you achieve that, you have to, it, it requires, it has some different rules or something. Mm -hmm. You can't go, go beyond what is shown in the site plan. Correct. Without amending the site plan, Without it's just like a SWIP, you know, as you, as you, you right. know, change things that um, you amend your SWIP. It's very similar to that. Um, like I said, Cody and I are going to discuss with Mr. Chad. We have uh, been working on getting a meeting set up with him to go through maybe some phasing and get some of this area um, stabilized and, and done and have it moved to the other area. Further questions? I just have one. Well, it might lead to a follow-up one. So they filed a an actual complaint, uh, a formal complaint with the county, the the residents in the area. No, we have not received a formal written complaint. The only um, complaints that have been is at the board of commissioners meetings. So for us to even consider a stop work order, they would need to file that initial complaint. Um, you know, we've gotten phone calls and things, but we haven't gotten the formal written complaint. Um, given the nature of it and being in front of the board of commissioners, you know, we. We are working with them as, okay. as as it is a complaint. Is there any other folks from the audience that wish to speak on this issue? Matter which one? Nope. I'm Russ Brown. Uh, my wife and I own the property just to the southeast of his uh, of the construction site. I'm a little concerned about a couple of things. One, I've heard several people say that the homeowners or the property owners have been contacted. Nobody has rang my phone. Nobody has knocked on my doors. Um, second comment I've got is you're talking about possibly issuing a blast permit. When Pete Lean blasts across Universal, it shakes my house. I'm right next to him. What's that going to do to my property? I'm really concerned about that. And uh, as far as the dust, if any of you would like to come out, I could walk you around. My wife has spent a lot of time in our backyard building a pond and a waterfall. We, can't even, we won't even be able to use it because of all the dust. Um, it's ridiculous. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Brown? Okay. Thank you, sir, for your comments. Anybody else? Please come forward, sir. Planning Commissioners, Commissioner. My name is Robert Watts. I live at 3850 Marvin Road. And right here is Lot 2R. That's my property. And I've owned it for 20 years. Paid my taxes faithfully. Never been in arrears. The Planning Commission's job is to make sure that responsible lawful growth happens. Part of their job is to protect the people who are affected by ill planned growth. We're not being protected by that right now. There's no dust control. There's no erosion control. There doesn't seem to be any clear plan at development. I was told that the jet right here on this hilltop uh, that there would be nothing on my skyline, and yet there's a big pile of jip up there right now. That there wasn't going to be a house or a building up there, it was going to be on the back side of the hill. So, why are we digging up there? I don't know. Why are we digging up the whole back side of the other thing? I don't know. I don't see any building corners, I don't see any survey stakes, I don't see any cut fill markers, I don't see anything 
for two months of nonstop excavating activities. Now, I think most of you know that that's pretty expensive activity. And to go around digging holes just adds to the cost of whatever you plan to build. I don't really see that anything's going to be built at a center. I don't see it. I don't see any surveying. I don't see any construction, marking, and staking at all. That's what I've got to say about it. And I'd like to see some dust control. Because you know one of these days, it's going to stop being winter. Everything's going to dry up. I've already got red snow drifts. I don't know why I should have to live in a dust cloud all spring and summer, too. Anyway, this is clearly mining. And when you do mining, you have to have dust and erosion control. And it needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Any questions for Mr. Watts? No. Thank you, sir, for your comments. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Looks like we have one more comment. Please come up, sir. Please state your name for the record. I'm Jessica Smith. I've lived up there my whole life. Yeah, We've dealt we can't with. Hear you. Yeah, we can't hear oh, you. sorry. I'm short. Um, I'm Jessica Smith. I've lived up there my whole life. I grew up there. We've lived next to Pete Lanes. We've never had the problems that we do with them. At least they've always communicated with us. We've always gotten along with them. This isn't being seclusional to just one person. We do like to work with people. We do like to come up with plans. We're not just trying to be mean, but would you like to come out to my house and have a glass of water and walk around? You wouldn't be able to drink it. I have faith in you guys. And I'm hoping that we can come to some conclusion to make it livable, hospitable, not to cause huge problems, but to just have everything dealt with. I don't like living in a mud bath. That's what my porch is right now. Does this have any effect on humans or dogs that breathe the gypsum in? It is lime that you're dealing with. Is it going to have corrosive behavior on the houses? of how long this is going to be going on. We have family get-togethers during the summer. How is that possible? Thank you for listening. Have a good day. Any questions? Thank you for your comments. Yes, sir, please come up. My name is Mark Wiley. Um, let me see if I can get this back up here. Uh, I'm going to need an overview. Okay, right there. That's good enough. Right through this area, if you follow that cursor, right through here is the main line gas line coming into Rapid City. There's two lines, one's a 10 inch and one's an eight inch gas line. Now, I know I'm on Williston Basin is very sensitive about that line. It's been in there since 1936. Hmm. And I don't think they're gonna approve any blasting in that area. So I just, I was gonna mention that, and I spaced it and I didn't, so I thought I'd better mention it. Any questions? Thank you for making the note of that. I'm assuming that Mr. Shad has is aware of the gas lines that are on his, that run across his property, as well as the the current owners. Um, so there is no uh, action items necessarily from from the board's uh, perspective regarding those items. Um, the 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 teeth, if you will, that I see that the county has in this instance is there's a there's an ongoing construction activities uh, slash mining that that's going on, um, and and they, if there are obviously nuisance complaints to those activities, and so the their uh, corrections to these items are are going to be associated with the enforcement of the construction permit. 
So I appreciate everyone's uh, coming to our meeting today and voicing your concerns uh, for the record and, and those being on, on the record. Um, Cody will be following up with the landowner uh, and, uh, and, and um, the, con the construction activities that are going on there shortly. So um, <clears throat> moving forward to item C. Mr. Chairman, can I make a statement on that one real quick? Right before we go ahead, Travis. Um, can we get the um, planning staff to update us um, through email, all of us, what's going on with this, so we have an idea, see how how fast or how slow it's moving for for the process, so we can just kind of keep an ear out and see what's going on, and maybe put our two cents in if there's something that's going on, if it's taking too long or whatnot, or if we think that it might be. Yes, we can do that. That's okay. fine. Yeah. Appreciate it. And just so you know, they will be on um, the Board of Commissioners agenda on the 21st. So that same issue will be on the 21st agenda. Correct. Thank it's you. It's going to be follow up. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So, yep. Item C. <clears throat> Item C is just I wanted to introduce we have a new planner one in our office, Stephanie Jansen. Um, so I was just going to have her come up and introduce herself to you. Um, you know, she's um, pretty much hit the ground running and already working on staff reports. So you'll see some from her at the next meeting. So, hi. <laughs> what, what was your name again? Stephanie. Stephanie Jansen. Stephanie Jansen, welcome. Thank you. Could you go could ahead, you, Kathy. Stephanie? Could you just give us a little background on sure. where you came from and what your experience is and so on? And what made you famous? Yeah. Um, I'm actually from Boise, Idaho. Um, I did GIS for three and a half years for the federal government. Um, and then when I first moved here, I did agricultural research. So now I'm going to planning. Welcome. Thanks. Very good. Item D. And then item D is um, we did uh, get approval from the Board of Commissioners in our budget to have a part-time person um, to do some scanning in our office and to get a lot of our files digital um, and get our building permits attached to our track it system and get some of our reports available because eventually um, working with track it we would like the end user i.e. the public to be able to access some of that information without having uh, to call our office. Um, so that person is going to be starting on the 27th and you will recognize her. Uh, it's Kelsey Rouse. She's coming back to um, get some of that stuff digitized and online for us. So, so those are the only two things okay. we have updates. Anything else? Nope, that's it. Uh, item 18, items from the membership. The one question that I have is the progress on the on the applicants for the uh, planning director. Is there any updates on that, sir? Good morning, John Worrell, uh, County Human Resource Director. So updates, we have currently 11 applicants as of this past weekend of those applicants to have the qualifications that we're seeking. So they've been invited to actually uh, produce or provide me with answers to a set of questions related to their experience, related to their leadership, and related to their qualifications and their interest in this position. So I hope to have uh, additional updates soon. So. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Great. Mr. Chairman, who will then make the final decision on who was hired? Fair question. But no, thank you for that additional question. So at this point, the, the interviews once arranged will actually be conducted with a member from your board, with two members from the Board of Commissioners, and then with myself. And then I intend to include two additional departments that work very closely with the planning department. So there'll be a group of six or seven. And they'll vote on it? Or? Yeah, so as we go through the process, you bet. So it ends up being uh, a review, first of all, do we believe they're competent, but then actually uh, a vote, if you will, as to that being the person to offer. Thank you. You bet. Additional questions? Thank you. Thank you for coming. Any further items for membership? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. Motion and second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, no. 
motion carries. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone.